Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Circling Seattle Sports on Converge Media. I am your host, as always, Charles Hammaker. Due to some scheduling stuff, and because we do the show here on Mondays, we won't have a Seahawks recap for this week, simply because they're playing the Saints here on Monday Night Football here in Seattle. Um, we will look at that game a little bit more because there are some things that have fed into that game leading up to it. Obviously, some stuff that's going on on game days. But so for next week's episode, we will have both week eight and week nine to go over both the Saints and the Jaguars, both those games at home. So we won't have a Seahawks game recap for this episode here, but there is still stuff to talk about, of course. Um, so from here, we just jump into the game uh, injury news. Uh, prior to game time, leading up to the leading up to game day, uh, October 23rd, Russell Wilson is still on track for a week 10 return. He had the pin removed from his finger. And barring any hiccups, Wilson is on track to return in Week 10 on the road at Green Bay. Obviously, that's not for certain. That's something that's just been put in place, you know, kind of put in place by the team, by Wilson himself. But because of his drive and the way that Russell is, more than likely we will see number three back on the field for the Seahawks in uniform in Green Bay in Week 10. But that's still a developing story. Uh, other things that took place on the 23rd, Alex Collins was expected to play uh, Monday versus New Orleans after being previously listed as questionable with a groin injury that he sustained in Pittsburgh against the Steelers. And running back Rashad Penny was also expected to be good to go Monday uh, versus New Orleans after returning from the injured reserve list. As I've talked about in previous weeks, since the pandemic, since last year, injured reserve has shifted down to a three-week minimum stay. So that's why you're seeing guys like Penny come back after a short injury stint, not coming back after week eight similar to Wilson and Carson, both of those guys will be eligible to return by week 10. Obviously, that's not when there should be, uh, will absolutely be good to go. Uh, so obviously, no game day inactives to go over as we're you know doing this uh, prior to that Monday night football game going on. Uh, and team-related notes, though, on the 20th of October, the team claimed quarterback Jacob Eason off of waivers from the Colts. This is an interesting move just because you still have Geno Smith on the roster. You've got Marysville native Jake Luton backing up Geno Smith, but then Eason is a former Gatorade player of the year when he was back here in Washington, played a year with the Huskies here, and has now found his way back to Seattle. Uh, he will not be available Monday versus the Saints as he's still getting integrated into the system and learning the offense, but certainly uh, an interesting move that's been made uh, just considering the, you know, having Geno Smith, having Jake Luton, uh, just adds another quarterback to the fold, and maybe he gets dropped when Russell comes back. Who knows? It, it might just be more of a, a safety valve kind of move for Seattle there. On the 23rd, Seattle reportedly has had talk centered around defensive end LJ Collier at previous points this season. Collier has been a game day healthy scratch for almost all of the games that he has been part of this season. It's been all but two games. He has been a healthy scratch this year for Seattle. That's not exactly good news for a former first-round pick, but there has been some interest in Collier uh, from other teams around the league. He has been talked about in trade talks, so whether that evolves into something or not, we will have to see, but it's interesting to hear that somebody who's been a healthy scratch for Seattle is gaining trade interest from around the league. And then on 25th, prior to game time, the team released offensive tackle Cedric Obwehi. Obwehi was a first-round pick back in 2015, and has been on and off injured reserve uh, with Seattle here this season. Just hasn't really been able to stay healthy, hasn't been a starter for Seattle, um, and he finds his way off the team. Uh, in league-related news, betting. I remember when sports betting wasn't a thing. The NFL has helped fuel a $1 billion betting revenue around the country. New Jersey had a record September fueled by wagers on NFL games showing how much money is just involved in sports betting. That's just New Jersey. I mean, that's a little ridiculous. Um, we get into other NFL-related news. Congress is probing the National Football League. The U.S. government wants Commissioner Roger Goodell to answer questions about the way that the league has handled the Washington football team situation and team investigation. That is something to monitor as this continues, as it relates to the next point that we have to talk about in league-related news. As John Gruden stated, in a cryptic phone call that the truth will come out regarding the way uh, that he was released from the Raiders as the head coach and just surrounding his entire scandal there. So some interesting things taking place around the league and they don't even involve the play on the field. 
both with Gruden and the Washington football team criminal investigation, amongst other things that have happened with the Washington football team. So ahead of the Monday night football game, the team still sits, the Seahawks still sit at a two and four record. They are third in the NFC West, thanks to the 49ers losing to the Colts on Sunday night football yesterday. And looking ahead for Seattle, they will take on the Saints uh, here later in the day at 515 at home on Monday night football. And then uh, on the 31st, this upcoming Sunday, they will take on the Jacksonville Jaguars at home at 1.05 p.m. with uh, 1.05 p.m. kickoff on CBS for week eight. So that's something interesting to note. Uh, just, you know, we play Monday. We got, we'll go over both of those. And then uh, rookie quarterback Trevor Lawrence comes to town with Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer, if you have not known, has been in some interesting waters uh, in terms of the news related around him. Um, that's a whole different topic. Uh, but another interesting case comes to town, uh, another interesting team for Seattle to not overlook, just considering how the season's gone so far. As we shift over to our Seattle Mariners here, who are still in the offseason, but that you know, with that being said, there's still things going on in the organization, still things going on in MLB. Uh, the upcoming deadline for uh, the Rule 5 draft is coming up, so teams need to make any roster moves ahead of the end of the World Series. After that takes place, uh, eligible players are selected for the Rule 5 draft. Is essentially like, in a way, it's like an expansion draft. Players are eligible to be picked um, from other teams despite the fact that they're not coming out of college. So Seattle needs to sort of clean up the roster and chalk up any talent that they don't you know, see in their future plans. Um, looking into that, those moves were made on October 22nd. Infielder slash outfielder Sam Haggerty was outfielder out. Ooh, pardon me, outrighted to Triple A Tacoma. Infielder slash outfielder Shed Long Jr. was also outrighted to Triple A Tacoma. He would decline the outright and elect for free agency after the World Series. Right-handed pitcher Darren McKagan outrighted to Triple A Tacoma. Outfielder Marcus Wilson was also outrighted to Triple A Tacoma. Right-handed pitcher LJ Newsom was claimed off of waivers by the St. Louis Cardinals. Right-handed pitcher Ryan Weber took the same track as Shed. He was outrighted to Tacoma, but he declined that outright and elected free agency. So a few guys that you've seen over the past few years, Shed Long having that incredible grand slam to win the game on Father's Day this past year against the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, personal, you know, I was a fan of Shed, uh, but obviously all of these sports are a business and you're always looking to get better and you have to look at other guys who may not be in your future plans. And some of those guys like Shed, uh, like Ryan Weber, they're not going to always... Fan favorites aren't always going to work out is essentially what I'm trying to get at here. Uh, so you may see some more of these moves made over the next coming weeks uh, as the Mariners you know, get ready for free agency and get ready to really look at who they want to keep going forward, who they envision you know, on the team next year and years ahead, and who they might say, hey, we can potentially do without you, or you've, you know, you've served your time with us, and uh, either you're going to go to free agency or we might trade you. So off-season moves are coming. Expect for that, hopefully, to be a big off-season for Seattle this winter. And then the other big piece of news, the main piece of news for the Mariners here, actually took place today on the 25th. Ken Griffey Jr. bought shares in the Mariners, and he will join the club's ownership group. He is the first former player for the Mariners to buy share in the club. Um, and really, it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting to see that Griffey has done so, simply because he is an advisor to the commissioner um, in terms of being a league ambassador uh, and was also joined the uh, Mariners organization as an advisor to the team following his retirement in 2011. Uh, so to see Griffey, you know, buy stakes in the team and to join the ownership group officially with John Stanton, that's something interesting to see, just considering where the direction that this team is heading in the past few years that the Mariners have had, you know, with this rebuild, with uh, this reimagination of the roster and how critical this offseason is, how I've hammered that, you know, over the past few weeks. Um, I'm sure that, you know, in, even in the press conference, Griffey said, we're here to win games. I hate losing. So it's, uh, it'll be critical to see what sort of role Griffey has um, in the ownership group now. And, you know, if anything, that adds more pressure on John Stanton to go and spend money this free agency 
and really bring in some key players to help round out this roster and push for playoffs for the first time since 2000. And was it 2001? Yeah, shoot. I keep telling people, the year I was born was the last time they made the playoffs. It's terrible. They always tell me they feel old. I'm sorry. It's not your fault. It's mine. Uh, heading into our Seattle Sounders here over the past week, they took on the Colorado Rapids and the and Sporting Kansas City. Both of those teams, respectively, are third and second in the Western Conference. Uh, and with good results over those past two games, Seattle could clinch the first seed in the Western Conference. That's an if. So as you see now on your screen, that didn't exactly happen. On October 20th, the team traveled to Colorado to play the Rapids. They came out with a 1-1 draw. They had to come from behind in that game. Uh, substitute Leo Chu from Brazil was able to assist Christian Roldan, who would score the tying goal late in the half, in the second half, uh, creating his fourth goal in the past five games. Uh, but still, kind of want to get those three points especially when you're team playing against teams one in the Western Conference and two, you're playing a team that, you know, is close to you for that first seed. You could tumble um, considering that both at, uh, at the time of this recording, Colorado and Kansas City have the same amount of points. Uh, and then October 23rd, the team would come back home to play Sporting Kansas City in their own building. Sporting has a winning record in Lumen Field this past year, and they would continue that streak. Uh, beating Seattle 2-1, uh, to one, play the game for that game would be Nico Benize with one goal. Uh, that was a really interesting game. Now, I want to say that because if you haven't seen it, I need to preface this. Um, there was an instant in the match, an instance in the match in the second half where Christian Roldan uh, was in goal. He was effectively screening uh, sporting goalkeeper Tim Melia from so the sounders could get a better shot you know block the goalkeeper so he can't see what's going on right and melia took out his frustrations by effectively do if you know what wwe is he rock bottomed christian rolled on i'm not kidding the video is out there the rock himself dwayne johnson even replied to it um he took rolled on uh like this and he slammed him into the ground in the goal that is no exaggeration the clip is real um I've never seen something like that in all the time that I've been around the game of soccer. And Melia was not given a red card. He wasn't ejected. He hasn't been fined. He hasn't been suspended. The league just kind of took it because they got the attention of The Rock and The Rock tweeted about it. The league kind of went with, oh, this is funny. This is great. This is good publicity for us. We're not going to mess with that. That sets a bad precedent because of the fact that a player quite literally body slammed another player on the field and you didn't properly um, punish him for that action. So that is something that is going to be talked about and watched in the coming weeks to see if Melia is disciplined further than just a yellow card in that game. But I've, I've never seen it. He quite literally rock bottomed him. If you don't know what rock bottom is, just look up WWE rock bottom and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's, you could play the clip side by side. It looks the same. It's just kind of outlandish that no further action was taken place. Obviously, the Sounders could have won that game outside of that taking place. You never really want to look at the refs and place sole blame on them, but still a frustrating thing to take place. Um, in team notes, as we transition away from the Sounders getting a draw and a loss in their past two games, Jordan Morris may be eligible to return versus LA. This is big news just because Jordan Morris was on loan with Swansea over the past year in 2020. Um, home count, homegrown kid, you know, from Mercer Island. Great story. One comeback player of the year in 2019 helped win the MLS Cup. Um, and then gets loaned to Swansea, tears his ACL. Another thing that was tough for Jordan, considering that he tore his ACL previously. So for him to come back uh, late in this season to help the Sounders through the MLS Audi Cup playoffs would be huge. He is eligible to return in their next home match, which is, no, which is November 1st versus the LA Galaxy. That just may be eligible is, you know, not a 100% thing, not a guaranteed thing, but it still would be a huge boost, boost to the Sounders, just considering also that Raul Ruiz Diaz is still dealing with an injury. The team now, the Sounders sit at a 17 win, 7 draw, and 7 loss record. They are still first in the Western Conference, but only by three points. Um, they are second in the MLS in points with 58. They have lost um, their past loss, draws them out of 
supporter shield competition that means they had the chance to have the most points in the league but new england is about nine points ahead of them and with that loss the sounders are out of contention for the supporter shield so uh, you know at the end of the day that's not the end of the world you know if you win the mls cup that's what matters um it just means that if the sounders advance the mls cup the championship game and if new england advance then new england will have home field advantage um the next game for the sounders is october 26th at lafc at 7 30 p.m pacific time that is a big game also just considering that as i mentioned with the loss to sporting kansas city if the sounders somehow manage to if the sounders lose one of their next three games and kc wins out kc takes first in the west so you're seeing now seating is big you know you want to guarantee that the playoffs run through seattle and you don't have to play any road games until maybe mls cup but now it's you just got to take care of your own business uh, there's no storm news over the past week that's kind of surprising there's nothing to talk about um most of the players are overseas playing in the euro league right now uh katie lou samuelson carly samuelson sierra burdick uh and epiphany prince are all overseas so best of luck to them overseas in their euro league seasons uh, and healthy returns for them seattle kraken over the past week played three games um since we last spoke with you on october 18th they traveled to philadelphia to play the flyers in a brutal uh six to one loss player of the game would be carson Susi. he had one goal on three shots the only goal for the crack in there october 19th at the new jersey devils uh, the team would lose two to four player of the game would be jared mccann with one goal on two shots with two hits and october 3rd 23rd the big home opener game for the crack in here in seattle at climate pledge arena versus the vancouver canucks the Kraken will lose that game two to four. Play of the game would be Mark Giordano with one goal, uh, one point, and four shots on goal. The home opener at Climate Pledge Arena. I get it. You know, you look at the team's record right now, only one win uh, in six contests. Not exactly ideal, but I need, need you to realize now, you know, this is the franchise's opening year. You got a bunch of guys who were on different teams just a few months ago. Uh, they're still trying to figure it out. Chemistry is something that doesn't come man manufactured in a bottle. This is something that's going to take some time to figure out. You know, guys are still working on how they play with each other. Uh, I'm even uh, have read from press conferences with Jordan Eberle and Jaden Schwartz that they're still getting used to the ice back at Climate Pledge Arena, hence why they practice there today, um, which is an interesting thing. I, I guess it kind of makes sense considering, you know, there's debate on playing on turf or on real grass you know in different sports like football like soccer um so you know for uh playing surface to be a thing that's an issue in hockey makes sense um but anyway point being this is a young team this is a team that was drafted young and that was done on purpose by ron francis and dave haxtall to set this team up for success in the years coming everybody sees vegas's success in their first year you know having that sort of oddball mentality um and making uh, the Stanley Cup final and they want Seattle to repeat that realistically that's more than likely not going to happen uh and it, the Golden Knights got really lucky with their draft they got a multiple Stanley Cup winner as their keeper because one team had two Stanley Cup winners as their keeper on their roster and they just had a really good draft the teams saw that in the NHL and they said hey we can't let this happen with Seattle that's why our draft ended up as it did, and our draft got some ridicule for that. Um, so I implore you to just have some patience with this hockey team. They're going to figure it out. They've got a lot of talent. It's just about making, uh, seeing how it all fits together, how the pieces of the puzzle really fit in there. So um, it's still really exciting. The atmosphere at Climate Pledge Arena on the 23rd was great. Uh, it's exciting to see that, and, you know, Considering it's a long season, we won't be, uh, we won't have few numbers of that to have, few chances for that to happen. We will have a lot of chances to see the Kraken back on home ice in front of the great crowds that Seattle Sports, Seattle Sports produce. Uh, and team related news on the 23rd, on that opening home game, the team retired the number 32 in honor of the fans and of everything happening, being the 32nd franchise, getting 32,000 deposits. Um, initially four season tickets obviously with the arena being 17,000 not all those could be fulfilled 
but just the way that the number 32 has played out for this franchise, the team has retired that number and it now hangs in the Raptors at Climate Pledge Arena. The team now sits at a one win, four loss, one overtime record. Um, oops. They have three points, which is interesting how that works. You get two points per win, one point for overtime game. They're six in the Pacific Division, uh, just ahead of Vegas, ironically. Uh, looking ahead on October 26th, they will play the Montreal Canadiens with a 7 p.m. puck drop. October 28th, they will play the Minnesota Wild at a 7 p.m. puck drop. And October 31st versus the Rangers to end the three-game stretch at home, they will play uh, for a 7, 6 p.m. puck drop. So... As I mentioned, this is a team that is both young and still figuring each other out. They will get it right. It would be great to see them just bounce back and get a win here on Tuesday against the Canadians. And now, um, for the first time on the show, we have the rain officially. Obviously, last week kind of announced it and had it out there. We have the rain on the show. They did not play this past week. They had international break in the NWSL. So all the uh, women in the league that are on their national teams had matches for World Cup qualifiers. Uh, four rain players made appearances for their international teams over the past week, which would include Angelina for Brazil, Quinn for Canada, Jimena Lopez for Mexico, and Shirley Cruz for Costa Rica. In other related team news, the rain released a team official app that will include exclusive videos, match updates, team news, behind the scenes coverage, and more. I just include that in there because, you know, with the way that women's sports are, there's always a lack of coverage, which is terrible and is something that I hope to achieve, um, I hope to work around and improve on. You know, we've got the storm on the show, we've got the rain on the show, so if you need something like that to keep updated with match updates, team news, behind the scenes stuff, the rain app is official, uh, it is out now. I do have it set up, so if we go here, it's just OL rain. I don't know if I can show this. Um, but it's got articles, videos, updates, you know, like I just mentioned with the four international players, um, it's all on there and you have exclusive chances to win merchandise. So again, if you want to get involved with our professional women's soccer team, they play just in Tacoma. You know, you've got players like Megan Rapino, Rose Lavelle, those world-class players play here. You know, when the U S women's national team goes away, those players don't just sit at home. They've got club teams. So I implore you to support those women as well. Uh, in league-related news, Alex Morgan says that the trust has to be built back up between the league and its players amid the talks regarding demands from the NWSLPA. So now I will fill you in on this. Uh, in the NWSL, the National Women's Soccer League, uh, there were a few different scandals. Uh, one was with former coach Paul Riley. Paul Riley um, has allegations against him of sexual abuse and manipulation, both with former players and with staff around the different teams that he coached. Now, this is a problem simply because one, obviously the things that he committed, as well as the fact that after this news came out, he was hired by two other different clubs after the initial abuse was reported. The league commissioner got this news from several different players and even Morgan herself was helping out and emailed commissioner, former commissioner, um, Lisa Baird. Baird got this news, sent an email that said we were going to conduct an investigation and nothing ever came of it. It was essentially silenced. So this is a big deal. Uh, in the past few weeks, the players and the Players Association have been pushing for change and have done so with Baird being pushed out. A new CEO uh, is an interim right now, Mara Messing. Maria Messing, we'll get to her in a second. Um, but the players are really fighting for change in this league and it's uh, inspiring to see, but also know that we need to support these women in this change simply because they're not being treated correctly. Uh, and it should just be a case of just like any other job. This is my job and I want to come to work and be able to just do the work that I need to do and not have any distractions. Um, continuing with that league news, the U.S. Women's National Team defender Becky Sauerbrunn described the past several weeks, as I've been talking about amid fallout from NWSL allegations, as really tough and interim CEO of the league, Maria Messing, says that the league has agreed in principle to meet the demands set forth by its Players Association. So big news again, but we need to continue to back these women so that they get the treatment that they deserve. Um, for our Royal Reign, they sit at a 12 win, 12 win, three draw, eight loss record. They are second in the league with 39 points, and their next match is against Kansas City NWSL on the road on October 30th with a 6 p.m. Pacific time kickoff. That is a big game simply because 
if the rain win that game, they, they lock up second place in the league, the second seed, and they will be able to host a playoff game back in Tacoma at Cheney Stadium uh, on a, a November 14th. If they lose that game or draw that game, they have the chance to be bumped down into third or lower and then have to play November 7th in the first round of the playoffs. So in any sport that you play, first round by, always important. Not always a guaranteed win for you in the next round, but always important. So another week of Seattle sports. I mean, uh, next week we'll have two games for the Seahawks. Uh, the Sounders had a tough uh, past few games, uh, but still have a chance to lock up first in the West. The Mariners offseason continues on with exciting news of Ken Griffey Jr. joining the partnership group. Um, Kraken struggling their past few games, but it is a long season in the NHL. Uh, and they look to right the ship with three home games uh, on their slate next over the past over the next week. And then the Rain have a crucial game on the 30th that could help them secure second place. So all of it's exciting. It's all really great. And uh, just happy to be able to sit here and uh, keep you updated on that. Before I end anything, um, in studio here, my director behind the scenes, Salman. I mean, I just look at the lighting, man. You look, I look great in front of this, and I don't really don't say that, but you did a great job of this. Um, so I want to make sure that my guy behind the scenes is appreciated here because mainly what I do is I, you know, all of this stuff that I talk about is what I do. All this stuff that gets set up, None of that's me. So I need to make sure that is appreciated. Um, support your directors, man. Uh, with that being said, we will see you next week with another huge slate. Playoff implications, off-season implications, regular season stuff. All of it's still in play and all of it is important. With that being said, take care and we will see you next week. Thank you.